荣幸啊，参加这个今天这个技术 party 这个教授的演讲会。呃，那么首先我呃介绍一下我们这个讲座的呃下午的讨论嘉宾啊，首先是那个罗永生教授，他来自于河南大学文化研究系，呃，然后是孟忠杰教授啊，他是来自于华东师大的历史系。呃，那么例行那个本次讲座的还有呃台湾交通大学的陈光兴教授啊，还有中国美术学院的这个高世明教授啊，那么还有我们那个本次活动的灵魂人物啊，那个张春成先生。呃，那么我要回顾一下我们这个等一会儿这个切克巴蒂这个教授所要讲到的这个泰戈尔啊，这个在美国的中国之前的这个呃事情，我想结合一下。那么我做一个铺垫啊。那么也差不多一百年了，就是在一九二四年三月十二号，那么是那个印度的这个班加罗诗人泰戈尔啊，在上海登岸。那么也是这样一个礼拜天的早上下的小雨。哈哈那么这个，哎，我们这个那个这个这个帕蒂教授这个行程也差不多。今天完了以后啊，明后天也要去杭州。那么那一次呢，泰戈尔先生也是去了杭州，呃，住在那个灵隐寺。做了一个关于这个飞来峰的这样一个演讲，那么我建议那个这个帕蒂教授就是去杭州，也要去灵隐寺看一下，<笑>就是我们那个温习一下。呃，好的。那么当时泰戈尔到来时候呢，引起很多麻烦，因为我们当时呢，在中国的学界呢，所谓玄玉学派啊，这个和这个科学派之间啊，闹不可开交啊。那么这个。当时有很多革命知识分子啊，那么这个态度非常矛盾啊。他们认为这个泰戈尔的诗呢是非常好，但是呢，他的这种境界放在当时的中国的历史背景里面呢，不合时宜啊。那么我来看看那个当时几个著名人物的那个观点啊。青年作家还是写这个现实主义作家矛盾啊，他说泰戈尔叫人去陶醉啊，去冥想，去爱，那么这个很好，但是呢是逃避。中国这样一个气质摆在那里啊，你做这个东西，那么泰戈尔该怎么办呢？矛盾在报纸上这样给他指出，说泰戈尔应该教导中国青年，呃，甚至给他们指出，民族革命，它成为民族的国民革命的出路。泰戈尔来中国应该做这个事情。然后呢，当时呃还是很年轻的诗人啊，郭沫若，他说，这个世界如果经济制度不改革，那么一切关于。所谓的烦的啊，这个现实啊，这个泰戈尔讲的尊严啊、爱啊、福音啊，那么这自动谈话啊，就只是那个有闲阶级的咖啡啊，这个心理酒，呃，无产阶级在那里流血流汗，那么你说这个话啊，挺缺德，呃，所以说他在报纸上写说，泰戈尔的这个教导呢，说是这个和平和平啊，对于中国青年是毒药，那这个他的原话。那么我们这个鲁迅呢，他也不也是这个说了很重的话。泰戈尔离开没几天，他在上海的《申报》上写说，这个泰戈尔呢来中国，就像我们进口了一瓶香水一样。那么像徐志摩啊这些诗人啊，拿着泰戈尔的香水在身上抹一抹，这个大家都称那个泰戈尔是好像说是印度的中国诗人啊，他真正懂得中国的这个境界。但是呢，鲁迅说。他一走开以后，那么这个我们的徐志摩们啊，肯定把这个泰戈尔推一边去了，所以泰戈尔来了没用，啊、呃，所以那些伟大的那个以神论事的这个中国知识分子啊，当时对那个泰戈尔的这种呃教导啊，我觉得都好像是呃抱了这种否定的意见啊。不过呢，泰戈尔本人呢，根据我们那个乔尔巴蒂教授的那个研究哈、啊，他实际上。应该来说，如果我们仔细了解他的立场的话，是跟我们的科学派是很契合的。而且等一会儿那个那个这个巴蒂教授说，这个呃，在印度啊，这个泰戈尔和甘地之间，他们所展开的论争和讨论啊，实际上跟我们中国当时那个年代讨论差不多。而且他们也是跟我们中国的科学派一样，是放到一个这个西方科学的这样的平台上。来讨论印度、印度民主、印度的未来，这个，那么我们的杰克巴蒂要说，这个这种讨论啊，寻找这样的平台，是我们非西方国家啊，讨论自己未来的时候，好像不需要用的一个办法啊。那么好，我回到刚才这个故事里面，实际上泰戈尔来中国之前的三四年，他已经碰到我们、啊、中国这个留学生，后来成为著名的哲学家，叫呃冯友兰。
。当时那个冯玉兰就问他：“这个中国怎么最好？”泰戈尔当面回答：“科学，科学，快快科学。”那么泰戈尔的态度其实非常明显的。但是呢，为什么他到中国以后来了以后就会这么大的误解呢？你听完今天上午的那个这个帕蒂教授的讲座，我想你就会搞清楚啊。那么，呃。我觉得这个，我们今天上午呢，应该好好关注啊。等会儿这个就回来，就是将要将要展开的，在印度的所进行的，很类似于我们中国一九二四年左右的这样这场论争啊。这个，那么这个我把这个发现这个论文背后的基本立场稍微介绍一下啊。呃，呃，他说啊，就是说，呃，我们在中国，在印度，看过去，看未来。我们所用的历史叙述的框架，是西方人给我们的，甚至我们怎么写历史这种方式，也是西方人教我们的。那么，如果我们这样做的时候呢？呃，我们经常会啊，由于马克思主义啦、啊、或者新自由主义进来以后，我们很简单就用历史主义这种态度啊，去这个看作为现实，看未来。那么这个时候我们要小心。那么很奇怪的就是，基克帕特教授呢，没有说。我们要跟西方的这个历史主义啊做斗争，他还建议我们用，那怎么用呢？呃，我觉得我们过去呢用的太实在了，这个这个班教授建议呢，好像说我们可以用的比较 performative， 就是说用用，但是那 performative 这种状态，那我觉得个人觉得非常同意这个说法啊，因为我们写历史做历史叙述，在中国的印度，我们现在感觉到很失败。用吉克帕蒂教授讲，就是说，我们写啊写啊，发现我这个写和说的主体自己是失败的，是缺的。我们越做，越发现我们有问题。在中国，这是现实。我们的共产党的革命，我们的文化大革命，搞过了没有？搞了呀。搞完以后呢，不光失败了，而且我们这个后面非常的沮丧，很懊恼。就是我们照着西方人跟我们说的，我们做的比西方人跟我们讲的还要去近，还要做的更彻底，但是最后是更难受的一个结果。我们感到了失败，我们是自我打败的。你用了这套意识主义的这个这个这个套路而套路，那么我认为这是呃，这个巴蒂教授呃带我们去思考的一个很重要的起点啊。那么下午我们这个讨论呢，还会有这个呃。很多的展开，我们有三个嘉宾啊，会把我刚才这个论题呢充分展开啊。我希望把我们这个中国的这个现实啊，这个历史和未来的这种连接，我们这种苦恼抛给那个呢，齐桂花的教授。好的，那么这个呃，刚才说到文革啊，说到我们中国人搞的是所谓很绝望的政治，越搞越觉得懊恼，哪种政治？那么我我上前天吃饭的时候啊。这个班的教授告诉我，说他六七十年代是个学生时代的时候，他是一个很激进的毛泽东分子。那么这个当时六十年末的时候，毛泽东写给那个苏共的大概几封信，他们和他的这个激进小组都是从当时人民日报翻译成英文嘛，他们急急忙忙把它翻译成那个班加洛的语，出版在他们地方上最大的报纸上，很激动的啊。这个，那么这个，我觉得这个这个非常。呃，非常有感触哈，就说我们几百年以前从印度那里进口这个佛教过来，实际上他们印度朋友又是我们这里拿走了这个毛泽东思想。那我我觉得这笔买卖啊，这个进出口贸易，我觉得就是谁赚了呢？我觉得好像是我亲近的感觉啊，我觉得可能是我们的印度朋友们赚了。<笑>这个，说，这个这个是，呃，我觉得是那个，呃，严肃的是说法，就是说我真的感觉就是说，是不是在吉格鲁巴蒂这个教授之外哈、啊，我们毛泽东的这条道路呢，可能也是一个我们探讨世界的未来的一个很好的一个平台。呃，那么我就讲这么多，下面我们很欢迎这个吉格鲁巴蒂教授跟我们做演讲。Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Li Xinghua, for those um, uh, welcoming and warm remarks. Thanks to my very old friend, Huang Xing, for the invitation, to uh, Chang Johnson and uh, uh, Chen Yi for uh, everything they did to make it possible for me to visit. Um, I will not be speaking directly about Tagore's visit to uh, China, which I think Chatterjee talked about in, in, in some length, but I'll be talking about Tagore. Uh, 
but I think you're absolutely right to say that Tagore and Mao are the two reasons uh, why coming to China, uh, coming to Shanghai in particular, and then to, going to Hangzhou is almost uh, an act of pilgrimage, but a strange act of pilgrimage uh, to come to a, a China that is very much post Mao. Uh, uh, so I will just tell you a little bit about my own background before I get into the lecture so that you understand uh, the little bit of Indian history that I embody. Uh, India is, of course, a very large country, and there are many histories, and, and by no means do I claim that the history that speaks through me is necessarily representative of all of India. In fact, yesterday we had a very interesting discussion about how the different ways in which different communities, different groups claim to be Indian. So there's nothing particularly authentic or authoritative in my claim of my bit of India. But I was born and I grew up in the very colonial city of Calcutta. Uh, and uh, Shanghai was one place we always remembered as we uh, read into labor history and Marxist history actually was for 1927 workers' strike and workers' uprising. And, uh, but by the time I grew, I was born after India became independent, 47, you know, just a few years, two years before the Chinese revolution was successful. And we were growing up imbibing the nationalism of our parents because our parents were fighting against British rule. By the time I was born, the British were gone. But there was still a lot of anti-British sentiments. And as I was coming into high school, India and China had a war. And that war produced a lot of discussion inside our homes, with our friends, cousins, older friends, and one group of Indians, most majority of Indians, were blaming China for that war. But at the same time, I had some cousins, older cousins, who were communists, and who were telling me, look, communists will never start a war. It must be India that started this war. And because our government is a rich, is a rich people's government, you know, Nehru represents the bourgeoisie in this country. So by the time I left school and went into my undergraduate years, so the war was uh, 62, um, you know, I was convinced that India was at fault. So the lot of me and my friends who used to argue with other Indians supporting China in that war and not supporting India. And, uh, and when, you know, I'm a, I was born in a Brahmin family. And you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you're born in a Brahmin family, you have to undergo a special uh, ritual uh, when you become Brahmin. It's a bit like Jewish, you know, Bar Mitzvah. So there's a ritual when it is called a sacred thread ceremony because you actually wear a thread across your body to signify that you're a Brahmin. And the presence that which I still have that my friends gave me on becoming a Brahmin where one was the Moscow published edition of volume one of Capital and, and published from Beijing, foreign languages publishing house, four volumes of selected works of Mao. <laughs> so my four volumes of selected works of Mao were volumes that I got on becoming a Brahmin. Uh, so my second birth, because <laughs> Brahmins are called twice born, <laughs> because with the initiation you are born the second time. So my, on my second birth, I was born as a Maoist. <laughs> and and uh, so what happened was that these, and this was happening throughout India, a lot of groups, you know, in the, you will, I mean, you may or may not remember that 59, the Soviet Union began to have difficulties with China, and Soviet Union began to withdraw all the technological support, engineers and technical people they had in, 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 in China. And by 62, there was two, the difference was very clear between the Soviet party and the Chinese party. And in 64, the Indian Communist Party split. One party supported the Soviets. Another party didn't commit itself. But it did not support the Soviets straight away. And we were young people becoming uh, angry about our country, angry about the fact that there were so many people who were poor in India, 
you know, in a way, you can imagine we were like your young students who were involved in the Tiananmen Square movement, except so many years further back, back the Vietnam War was going on, and we thought really the real problem in India is that we have an exploiting class and their politicians running the country, and we, what we need is a revolution. And the Chinese Communist Party was already saying the revolution has to be violent. You know, there was, there was all this there was saying of Mao, you, you will, may remember it, which said that you need the broomstick, just as you need the broomstick to clear the dust away, you need violence to clear the rich people away, right? And, um, and we were getting very drawn to Mao's teachings, and there was a peasant uprising in 67, just after the leftist communists and, and their allies had been elected to the state that I come from, which is West Bengal, where Calcutta is. And there was a peasant uprising which this communist party, which was not pro-Moscow, but not pro-China either, did not support, because they were in government. And we young people all supported that peasant rebellion. And because India and China were already enemies, People's Daily published an essay called Spring Thunder Breaks Out Over India, and gave us moral support. And that was 67. And in 69, all these people from different parts of India got together and formed the third Communist Party, which was called Communist Party of India Marxist-Leninist, CPIM, CPIML, which was the Maoist Communist Party. And, and there, and my friends used to go around in Calcutta and other places writing two slogans on walls in, in, in Calcutta. One said, China's path is our path. And you can imagine all the Indians got upset because China was our enemy. And China's chairman is our chairman. <laughs> and we used to argue with people on buses and trams about this. And we were all young people. And, and what they did when they formed the third Maoist Communist Party, because we said China's chairman is our chairman, some people actually sneaked into China through Nepal and offered the chairmanship to Mao. They said, we want you to be the chairman of the Indian Communist Party. And Mao declined. <laughs> but you know, we left that position vacant. <laughs> the highest position occupied by any Indian in that Communist Party was the vice chairman. <laughs> because the chairmanship was always open for Mao. If ever he felt interested, you know, he would get it. But of course he was never interested. But, um, but you can imagine that this was, this was our anti-nationalism. This was our internationalism. And we thought internationalism was something that was opposed to nationalism. And in 66, of course, the so-called Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution broke out. And we were, as the, as the Cultural Revolution was breaking out, we, we, we gradually graduated out of college. And in the meanwhile, these Maoists, young Maoists, became quite serious. So, so the vice chairman of the party said, you must now go to the villages, Red Guard-like, with a backpack on your back, with the Red Book inside, and go and find peasants, and organize them, and kill bad landlords, and that way we will begin to create a People's Liberation Army in India, this is 69, and by 1975, India will be liberated. So a lot of my friends, went into the villages. By this time, the police were against us, and the police were looking for us, torturing us. So, you know, I still remember a big meeting. I was very scared, because I, I came from a middle class family. I was not rich, but middle class, and I'd been brought up on fairy tales, Hans Christian Andersen, very sort of tender fairy tales, and I got very scared, because the Indian police are bad. They beat you, you know, they... they pluck out your nails, they do all kinds of things. So I was very scared and I told my friends, I said, you know, I cannot go through with this. I cannot go to the village and carry out this revolution. And I'm very ashamed of myself. So we had a self-criticism meeting like the Red Guards used to have and, uh, and a self-denunciation meeting. So I denounced myself and overnight I lost all my friends. They stopped talking to me. And India had just set up two business schools with American help. And I wrote the exam, and I thought, I belong to the dustbin of history. I must now simply earn money. My life has no other meaning. So all I can do is to go to a business school. So I went to a business school. 
in the meanwhile, and my friends went to villages. And of course, the first thing that happened to them when they went to the villages was to get diarrhea. So they all came back to cities for treatment. And then they went back again. They had trouble with their glasses. You know, the moment they wear glasses, peasant says, you're from the city. You're not one of us. <laughs> and then eventually, by 71, the Indian police moved into the villages, flushed them out of the villages. And then they came back to the cities. Then their program was very... Uh, pathetic program of killing individual policemen. And in the end, the movement was crushed. And about altogether, Amnesty International calculates that about 4,000 young Indian men and women died in that movement. But you know, I went to a business school to do an MBA to join the other side, right? To join multinationals. But as my luck would have it, the Indian government, this was the, the business schools were Nehru's idea. And he decided that Indian managers must have capitalist economics. In other words, the future of India would be capitalism. So our economics class was all, all capitalist. But our sense of the past must be anti-colonial. So we were the only two business schools in the world to have a compulsory class on history. And they appointed Marxists to teach us. So we had capitalist econom economists teaching us capitalism in the economics class. And Marxists teaching us anti-colonialism in the history class and when I finished my degree my professor said to me do you want to be a manager or do you want to be a historian and finding Marxist history was very comfortable, you know, very comforting because I was a student of physics and you know, I had not done history before and the reason why it was comforting was because I was very depressed that I had failed to be a revolutionary and Marxist histories actually tell you that the individual is not very important Historical forces are more important. So that helped me to rationalize my failure. <laughs> right? And because it was so comforting, I said stupidly to my professor, I'll become a historian. <laughs> so I gave up my job with the Scottish company as a trainee personnel manager and became a historian. Well, I mean, I became whatever I've become. Okay. And, uh, and then, you know, I went to Australia to do my PhD. I still remember that when I first went to Australia, late 70s, Chinese students were, began, were coming and I was meeting all these people. I was hoping that they would share with me my enthusiasm for the Cultural Revolution and they were all against the Cultural Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember a very angry argument with a Chinese woman, a student, and I said to her, I said, you are, but Mao had such beautiful ideas, you know, if you're, you're throw, aren't you throwing the baby with the bathwater? And, and she said, what's the use of ideas that don't work? And I used to write home to friends saying, these students must be from very reactionary families. You know? <laughs> They're not the right kind of Chinese students. <laughs> I'm waiting for the right Chinese student uh, to meet, and the right Chinese student never came. <laughs> the more they came, the more they were pro-capitalist, they were more pro-West, you know. I mean, it's not like now. Today, I think, you know, reading Chinese intellectuals, they have a much more nuanced understanding of what the West is. But, you know, when I was teaching in Melbourne, uh, it, after Tiananmen Square, I actually met your Kaisi. Uh, he came to Melbourne. And when I talked to him and I was asking him, so what did you actually want? You know, you created the goddess of liberty, but what was your vision? And it was clear that there were students rebelling. They knew what they were against, but they were not very clear about what they were for. But, but when I first met these Chinese students coming out of China, they were much more, uh, they were as romantic about the West as we were about China. You know? and, and our romanticism of China came from a long tradition of Western romanticism because you know, I remember there were all these Western academics. Joan Robinson was a famous economist uh, from Cambridge who came to China during the Cultural Revolution and then wrote a book saying how beautiful this was. Um, there was a New Zealander called Rivi Yale who used to write in a magazine published from Hong Kong called New Horizons. And if you go back and read Rivi Yale's descriptions of the Cultural Revolution, you would think that the Cultural Revolution was heaven on earth happening. You know, this was paradise. And we were actually imbibing that kind of romanticism. And in the meanwhile, May 68 happened in Paris. And a very well-known French philosopher called Louis Althusser, who was a teacher of Foucault's, wrote a couple of essays showing why, or claiming that Mao was a much better philosopher than Hegel. <laughs> and you know, we used to read this thin book which had called essays on four contradictions. 
um, and which was like our Bible on correct, you know, on correctly handing contradictions among people, uh, and all those sort of Maoist dictums and aphorisms about how contradictions happen. So basically, coming, to, it took me a long time to accept emotionally, psychologically, to accept the change in China. Because it just has took me a long time to realize that many things were wrong about the Cultural Revolution. That people actually suffered. Uh, that families suffered. I'm not saying everything was wrong with Mao, but clearly uh, certain things went wrong. We didn't know about the famine that followed the Great Leap Forward, for instance. It be I mean, it became a uh, uh, matter of knowledge much, much later. We used to defend, I still remember in India, defending backyard furnaces, saying that they gave people rational outlook, etc., etc. So that's, that's where I, so coming to China for me, and the first time I came was in uh, uh, Beijing, it's a very mixed feeling. I mean, now, you know, obviously reading Chinese intellectuals, talking to you, gives me a better sense of uh, where things are at, and I now find there's a much more, because of the openness, because of the mobility to the West, there's a much more nuanced, calibrated understanding of what the West is. Um, but that's the background. That's where I come from. And so what happened was all my friends who kind of think were, who were failed revolutionaries in one way or another, uh, but became historians, and not everyone became historians, but all the friends who were failed Maoists became historians, eventually started the project called Subaltern Studies. Because there was a romance globally about peasant revolution up to the 1970s, both, see, because of, uh, because of not only China, but also because of Vietnam, because of the resistance to the US by the Pathet Lao and uh, in Cambodia, even though Cambodian resistance started disastrous. But uh, I still remember that in our first meeting of subaltern studies, and Ranjit Guha, who was 20 years or older, who was giving us, who was kind of like our little chairman, and the first thing he said was, you know, we have to bombard the headquarters. <laughs> so, so internally, that was the slogan. <laughs> history writing was a matter of bombarding the headquarters. <laughs> and writing those great posters, like history would be those great posters you, you, you'd write. So that's where I come from. What I want to speak today actually though, now, you know, I'm older and, uh, and I, I understand uh, that that's, 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 that's a matter of history. And now increasingly, as I look at the world, I look at China and India as growing powers. Um, now I think any, and I wish them well. I, I actually want China and India to be powerful countries. I want them to lift their people out of poverty. Um, but it, it always raises a question for me. And the question that I often ask myself, and sometimes have asked a few Chinese friends, and this is, this is the question, and that is the question which is the background to my talk. And I say, that I understand, I'm on page two, Michael. I understand and even support your desires to be superpowers. But when you come to dominate the world truly and effectively, this is what I would say to in my head to China or India, that when you come to dominate the world truly and effectively, when you're as powerful, let's say, as the Americans are, what terms of criticism will you provide to your victims so that they can criticize your domination. In other words, what resources will you pr produce from within your tradition? And your tradition might include European tradition, because European tradition is everybody's tradition. But what resources will you produce that others will use to criticize you? Because I begin from the premise that no powerful country can be benign in all senses. Power is not a benign thing. If you become a powerful country, you're going to oppress some people internally, some people like externally. If India has to become a powerful country, we have to oppress some of the Kashmiri people. You know, there are many insurgencies going on in India. The Nagas never wanted to be part of India. We brought them in forcibly. Um, but that's how a nation keeps itself. And that's how a nation becomes powerful. While there are many benefits that follow from a nation becoming powerful, I think a powerful nation, if it also has to do, be good for the world, has, it, is, it has to take responsibility for its own power and create the terms 
with which its own victims will be able to criticize it. And in thinking about this, I make a distinction between, historically as a historian, between what I might call uh, an in Western, a European imperial mode of domination and a post Second World War superpower mode of domination. So if I think of superpowers, I think of US, the Soviet Union once. But if you think of the European um, mode of domination of the world, then it is, then certain things become very clear. Um, there's no doubt, for instance, that Europe and Europeans once dominated this planet. By the end of the 19th century, 80% of the surface of the earth was under the rule of one European power or another. Since 1945, we have seen a retreat of the colonial great powers of Europe and the rise of superpowers like the United States and once the Soviet Union. China and India today aspire to similar superpower status. I mean, India actually doesn't want to be an imperial power and I'm sure China doesn't want to be an imperial power in that old sense. A superpower dominates us, surely, economically, militarily, and technologically. It also undoubtedly influences our imagination. I mean, the 20th century cannot be imagined without the global domination of Hollywood or American television. Or even if you think of cities, I and mean, you know, from the hotel window, Park Hotel, when I look out, and I look at these two streets, the forks meeting at a certain point, and all the neon signs and then Nanjing Road going towards, towards the Bund, that, that meeting point is very reminiscent of Times Square in New York. And there's a, you can see that even in the new forms of cities we build, there is a Manhattanization of our imagination. So that when people from Mumbai come to Shanghai and say Mumbai must imitate Shanghai, what they mean is that Shanghai must imitate New York and Mumbai must imitate Shanghai, right? Uh, so there is a kind of, this, I'm, I'm not denying that there are many ways in which a superpower dominates our imagination. But a distinction remains to be made between European colonial domination of others and the sheer economic, military and cultural weight of a superpower. The distinction is this, that when European powers became imperial colonial, lords of the humankind, which was an expression that V.G. Kiernan, a Scottish historian, actually coined. From, let's say, the Renaissance to the Enlightenment and into the 19th century, they also gave their victims the terms and categories of thought with which to critique and challenge European domination. Two such great weapons of criticism, you know, Marx had a sentence that weapons of criticism, what did he say? A criticism of weapons is not the same as the weapons of criticism. But two such great weapons of criticism forged in the European workshop of the 19th century, but with their intellectual genealogies stretching further back into history, were Marxism and liberalism, both wielded with great effect by many decolonizing nations and thinkers who criticized European domination. So now I, that's why I come to this question, that if tomorrow China wants to be a big superpower, or India wants to be a big superpower, will we simply dominate in the way that Americans have dominated? Or will we dominate in such a way that our very domination will create visions of humanity that the rest of the humanity will actually use against us? And therefore I think a power, a really good superpower, if, if there could be a contradiction in terms, but if, if a really good a uh, superpower or a dominating power that wants to be good in spite of knowing that no power is benign has to create a certain contradiction within itself. You know, it has to create a certain kind of criticism within itself of what it is, of what its aspirations are. So will the, will the move beyond the horizons of European thought as China and India become dominant powerful country of this century, will we actually move beyond the horizons of European thought? Will China and India produce new grounds for thinking on which humanity will meet as one? And today this question is very important. If you look at certain question, problems of the world, they're global problems. Climate change is a global problem. Food security is a global problem. Terrorism is a global problem. 
water shortage is a global problem. Energy crisis is a global problem. And you know, you don't have to know people's culture and differences to know that people need water. I read an Indian report that for the first time in Indian history, India has actually ordered an entire tanker of water from an Alaskan company. I mean, India, which we think of as the land of rivers, right? China is now building, what, 21 or whatever many dams in the upper Himalayas, which worries Indians. Um, you know, and we don't have a water treaty with China. Uh, China has a water treaty with other countries. We don't have a water treaty, apart from the land problems, the border problems we already have. Now, these are global problems. And frankly, if, if anybody thinks that my development is going to happen at the cost of your development, that model of thinking won't, will not work. We have to, as we develop, we have to create some politics of commonality. Some politics of coming together on these planetary problems. And that's why when the last time I was in China, which was about three months ago, I was in Beijing, I was quite struck by discussions in English language Chinese newspapers on the need to move from the made in China phase, you know, everything you pick up now is made in China, to the created in China one. So they were saying we must now move beyond made in China and, be, and move to the phase that they were calling created in China. So I assume that these newspaper writers had material things in mind when they spoke of things being created in China. So like, you know, car designs, designs of electronic gadgets and those sorts of things. But if you stretch the metaphor of creating in China, then you can think something else. You can think that European domination of the world actually molded the world in a certain image of humanity that Europe created. You know, the German philosopher Heidegger used to say that European domination has created a very deep Europeanization of the world, of the planet. Out of that Europeanization of the world, we still create the normative ideas that we work with. Whenever we think what should be good for all, like when we have debates in China about, let's say, poverty, should there be less inequality? you are actually implicitly using a lot of European ideas. Can China and India aspire to the same role? And it is to ask this question that I want to share with you a historical vignette, as it were, of one particular word, which is civilization. That around that word, because around that word was created a middle ground during European domination. And that was a word that could actually create a sense of plurality, kind of a plurality of Europe, a plurality of the colonized and allow for a common meeting ground. So in a way what I'm talking about then, the, pro the question is this, how does a powerful country, you know, which cannot avoid dominating others because it is powerful, but being powerful by definition means you're going to upset some people. Uh, just as walking by definition means you're going to walk on some ants. You can't help that. So the question is, what kind of self-consciousness a powerful country can create so that it creates a plurality of its own self and helps the dominated create a plurality of their own self. And it's this, it is this politics of creating internal plurality that eventually creates a common ground on which, even though we can't escape the relations of power, we can create a dialogical relationship with that which we see as powerful. So I'm going to, in the first part of my talk, I'm going to use the concept of civilization as that word that belonged to European vocabulary, but around which, historically, such a plurality of Europe's and pluralities of India's were created, cre creating therefore the common ground. And, I was, and this common ground is what I will call civility. And I think civility is extremely important in the world. I'll defend it, but to give you you know, two examples. I mean, Gandhi was, of course, a past master at civility, even with people that he was disagreeing with or fighting against. So when he was in South Africa, once he was leading a strike of the Indian laborers there. But at a time when there was already a strike on of the engine drivers, of the railway engine drivers. So he wrote a letter to Smuts saying, we want to go on strike and create problems for you, but we don't want to add to your current problems. So we'll wait for this strike to finish the railway engineer strike, and then begin our strike. And you know, when Gandhi was put in prison by Smuts uh, as prison labor, Gandhi had to do things. So he actually, Gandhi 
created two sandals and gave them, sent them as presents to Smuts. And when Gandhi was 70, Smuts returned them as gifts to Gandhi, saying it was my luck to have to imprison this man. Or when Tagore and Gandhi differed, Gandhi made some statements in 1934 when there was, a, there was an earthquake in, in, in the state of Bihar. And Tagore disagreed very strongly. But before he disagreed, he actually wrote a letter to Gandhi saying, Gandhiji, G is honorific, like sir. Gandhiji, I heard in the newspaper, I read in the newspapers that this is what you have said. Have you actually said this? Because if you have said this, I'm going to oppose you. And Gandhi wrote back saying, yes, I have said exactly that. Please oppose me. And then Tagore writes in the newspapers saying, I disagree strongly with what Gandhiji has said. But this was civility. And I was going to come back to the question of civility in opposition. But so to begin with, I will then begin with the word civilization. Civilization, you know, as you know, European domination of the world was often justified by what the Europeans saw as their civilizing mission. Others were savage or barbaric, so they would go and civilize them, except that they thought, always thought of China and India as people with ancient civilization, but fallen on bad days. You know, they saw China and India as civilization in decline, whereas they saw, looked on Australian Aboriginals, Africans, or the Native Americans as uncivilized people. And it was very clear, the more uncivilized the Europeans thought you were, the more freedom they gave themselves to treat you badly. The more civilized they thought you were, the more the question of civility entered the field. So basically the word civilization, people have now done histories of it. Famously, the, the French linguist Emile Benveniste has written a very interesting essay on it. Lucien Febvre, another French historian, wrote a history of the word. So we now know that this word, expression civilizing mission, originally arose in French, then traveled to English in the, around the 1760s. Uh, and actually, a, an Australian scholar called Brett Bowden, Bowden has recently written a book called The Empire of Civilization, which has a very interesting history of this word. It carries it uh, up to uh, today. And the subtitle of the book is called The Evolution of an Imperial Idea. I will not go into the details of this history, nor will I you know, the word civilization, when it comes up today, comes up in the context of the Harvard professor Samuel Huntington's description of the clash with Islam as a clash of civilizations. So people actually criticize the word civilization. The word civilization in the last few decades, in many contexts, has been criticized. And I'll come back to the criticisms, but I'm not just going back as a historian and doing its history. There's also civilization and civility are also, as European words, they have uh, extremely interesting histories. Uh, uh, the ideas of civility and civilization arose at different times in European history. The word civility is older than the word civilization. In bringing the two words together, because, because Indians were always saying to the British, if you are civilized, if you have a civilization, why are you acting in an uncivilized manner? <laughs> so in connecting being civilized, that is being civil, with having a civilization, Indians were actually collapsing these two different histories into one word, into one practice. So they were actually, because in European history, the two words originally connected had become separate. Because the word civilization in the late 19th century could simply refer to the sphere of material culture. So you could actually, once archaeology became a subject, you can dig up a particular piece of land, find old pottery, and say there was civilization here. Right? But the word civil, in 18th century France, in 18th century French, had a more religious connotation. And this is where, civil, by, by civility, we mean to be actually civil to somebody. So the word civil in meant to soften our hearts, to make our hearts softer towards somebody else. And it was actually religious. Uh, call. You, you, you made your heart soft to your confraternity. So the intimacy between civility and religion was again a fraught one because civil had a secular use, like when you say civil marriage. So civil marriage you mean something that is not a religious marriage. So the word civility itself had this complication in its history that it was 
at once tied to religion in European history and also had a secular life where you could say civil against religion. And this connection that originated between civilization but, and civility was also breached by imperialists who actually by saying that you don't have civilization gave them permission, themselves permission to be rude to you. In other words, uh, if, you, if the Europeans thought you did not have civilization, then they also thought you had no demand to require civility from them. But Indian nationalists actually made this word their own. You know, this word civilization, I should also tell you, that at the end of the 18th century, when there was this phenomenon that we call Scottish Enlightenment, you know, Adam Smith is part of Scottish Enlightenment. And if you go to Edinburgh, you have all the statues of the Enlightenment thinkers, David Hume, Adam Smith, different street corners. The thinkers of Scottish Enlightenment developed the idea of civilization into a measure of how advanced or backward different peoples were. Right? So what we call stadial history, this idea that humanity has to go through stages, you know, which Marx inherited in saying initially there's primitive communism, you know, then there is feudalism, then there is capitalism, then there is socialism. This mode of thinking that human history has to go through stages, which in English is called a stadial view of history, was created by the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers. So, and that's the idea that the Europeans then actually used sometimes to dominate other people. This word civilization did not exist in Indian languages. So Tagore wrote an essay in the last year of his life, which is 1941, called Crisis of Civilization, in which he began by saying that the word that is used in Bengali and Hindi or in North Indian languages, Sabhata, did not exist in our languages. So civilization was a word that in Indian languages we had translated from Europeans. But yet this translation was a very important fact for nationalists. And this is what I'm going to now talk about, how Indians themselves took the European word and used it for their own purposes in order to create solidarities with Europeans. Europeans who were actually opposed to, let's say, the imperial pro project of Europe. So Indians could use the word civilization to find amongst Europeans, critics of imperialism, with which they would actually then make common ground. And I began, I will talk about in this context of my talk, I'll talk about four iconic, everyday elite figures of Indian nationalism. My first person would be Swami Vivekananda. You may or may not have heard about him, I'll show you pictures of him. Swami, which literally means Lord, that's why in marriage it can mean husband, traditionally. Swami is the word that Indians who have become, who has renounced the world and who have become religious saints use for themselves. So this man who had a different name called himself Swami Vivekananda. Then I will talk about Tagore. Then I will talk about Gandhi who does not need introduction. And I will talk a little bit about Jawaharlal Nehru who was the first Prime Minister of India and who was instrumental actually in inviting Shou Enlai to the Bandung Conference against the opposition of the Americans and the British. Um, so actually, Nehru was very instrumental in involving China in, in, the, in the Bandung Conference. And, uh, and Nehru was the Prime Minister who had to fight the war with China. And I think it contributed to his death, because the war was 61, Nehru died in 64. He was exhausted by that war uh, with China, because he had always thought about China as a great ally in many ways. So between them, these intellectuals also covered the period of the anti-colonial movement from roughly 1890 to 1950. They were all personalities who had some impact on the West. These people are all well known for the impact on the West. But there was a rhythm to their timing, to the timing and the nature of their impact. Their impact was heightened whenever Western intellectuals entertained doubts about the validity and the mission of their own, in, own civilization. So the influence of Indian thinkers on the West increased precisely when Western intellectuals felt doubtful about their own project. And that's why I'm saying the politics of being doubtful about your own project is very important if you're going to create this opening as a dominant power for conversation. Right? So take away this doubt, absent this doubt, and the impact of Indian critiques of the West is immediately reduced. So this seesaw, you know the game of seesaw, 
It's the seesaw feature of the historical career of the world civilization as it moved back and forth between the West and the East is an index of the historical role it played in creating a room for dialogue, a middle ground between the colonizer and the colonized. So my first case in point is Swami Vivekananda, who won recognition in the West at a time when very few male intellectuals in Britain or United States entertained any doubts about the global mission of the West. So there are two things I want you to notice. One, as, as I said, Vivekananda came to Ch Chicago in 1893, became world famous for a speech he gave, and I'll talk about it. But it was a time when either American men or European men were absolutely sure that Europeans were the best civilization in the world. They were so sure that, because you know, this is actually, if you as a historian, this is the period of growth, you know, from 1890s to the First World War, is almost a period of uh, uninterrupted growth for Europe. So this is the period in which the idea of progress becomes a very important idea. And this is also the period where the British begin to publish for every 10 years and every year an annual report, you know, like you get school annual report on your progress. The British began to publish an annual report on the progress of Indians. It was called Report on the Material and Moral Progress of India. As if we were, they were in a classroom. They were teachers and we were students and the parents were somewhere in the British Parliament. Right? And the teachers would send this report to the British Parliament saying, this is how well our children are doing under our guidance. So Vivekananda made his name. Let me see if I can show you if this will work. I'm never... Um, okay. Okay. So that's him. Swami Vivekananda. So Vivekananda made his name by speaking successfully at the first World Parliament of Religions held in Chicago in 1893. It's very interesting if you actually read the proceedings of that parliament which was held a few steps from where I live in Chicago, in the art museum and in part of the expo. You will find that finally, you know, just as money, Marx would say, was a common currency in exchange. You could, you could send everything through money to exchange uh, barters. This 19th century sort of European question, um, do everybody, do, uh, do all peoples of the world think of the same God? Right? Is God translating? You know, this was a very practical question for missionaries. Every time they translated the Bible, they had to find a word in your language that correspond to the Christian concept of God. So this question, do all peoples think of God? Has God given us intelligence to think of Him? Uh, this question was finally answered in the World Parliament of Religions, where different religious representatives tried to argue that my religion has the best conception. Oh, how did I get back to that? Okay. <laughs> okay, good. I'll show you two pictures of. That's also Vivekananda. Uh, uh, these are all pictures taken in American. So the World Parliament of Religions met and on another 9-11, that is 11th of September 19, 1893, Vivekananda addressed the assembly. There's a lot of Indian stories about you know, his glory, he had not been invited, he went on his own with Indian money and somehow managed to get five minutes to speak and apparently in that uh, assembly where thousands of people had gathered, he abandoned the stiff proceedings of the assembly and addressed everybody as he stood up as sisters and brothers of America. And he was a young, handsome, 29-year-old. And he and people immediately fell in love with Vivekananda. So 1890s made him immediately famous. And he was the first Indian to export modern Hinduism. So we talked about the export of Buddhism. Uh, you know, we know that historically Hinduism had traveled to Indonesia, to Cambodia, to Thailand. But he was, this is the Chinese supremacy over Indian things, you see, I get back to a Chinese pattern. Is it okay? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what's interesting about Vivekananda is, of course, that when he was in, when he was in, England, when he was in America, he wrote letters back home. 
And the letters show very clearly that he was very aware that the word civilization in 1890s was a completely political word. So, for instance, in a letter dated 6 May 1895, addressed to a disciple in the Indian city of Madras, he writes, after his success in America, 1893, he says, India is now in the air, you know, much like China is now in the air. Right? And the orthodox Christian clergy are struggling hard to put out the fire. And then he goes on to say, if you could send and maintain for a few years a dozen well-educated, strong men to preach in Europe and America, <laughs> preach Hinduism, you will do immense service to India, both morally and, he says, politically. Many of the Western people think of you, that is Indians, as a nation of half-naked savages, and therefore only fit to be whipped into civilization. If, if you 300 million become cowed by the missionaries, what can one man do in a distant land? But you know the interesting thing about Vivekananda is that for all the stories of success he wrote home about, the fact remains that an overwhelming majority of the people in the West who actually accepted and felt drawn towards the teaching of Vivekananda were women. And see what they wear. I'll come back to the question of the politics of what you wear. Yesterday we, again, we talked about whether Teju's uh, um, scarf was, uh, came from the sari. We talked about the politics of clothing, and actually I'm going to talk about the politics of clothing. So in this letter he says, I'm going to speak to a ladies' club, and my quaint Indian dress will not do because people gather by hundreds in the streets to just see me. And in fact, more than seeing him, this was still the America in which they would they were lynch mobs who would try to beat you up, like they would beat up an African American. So for instance, he left Boston, he said, because the man in the street stared and poked at him, like some object of curious and dubious nature. And Boston itself, the one letter he says, I landed in Boston, a stranger in a strange land. My coat was this red one, and I wore my turban. I was proceeding up a street in a busy part of town. When I became aware that I was being followed by a great number of men and boys, I hastened my pace, and they did too. Then something struck my shoulder. And I began to run, dashing around the corner and up a dark passage, just before the mob in full pursuit swept past and I was safe. So, and here's the interesting thing. Can we go back to that earlier one? Right. So, he writes in another letter, what I want to dress myself in is a long black coat and keep a red robe and a turban to wear only when I lecture. This is what the ladies advise me to do. <laughs> and they're the rulers here and I must have their sympathy. So you can see that it's American women who designed his gear, his lecturing gear, and that is the gear in which we know him. <laughs> there's, there's another letter about his popularity among women which says, in one of his letters he actually reproduces a newspaper report. And the newspaper report of his lecture says, ladies, ladies, ladies packing every place, filling every corner patiently waited and waited while the papers that separated from Vivekananda were being read. In fact, another American woman, a Mrs. S. K. Blodgett, who was present at the Parliament of Religions when Vivekananda opened his maiden speech, My Sisters and Brothers of America. And this woman writes in her memoirs, she says, when that young man got up and said, Sisters and Brothers of America, 7,000 people rose to their feet as a tribute to something they knew not what. When it was over, I saw, this old woman says, when it was over, I saw scores of women walking over to the benches, getting over the benches to get close to him, get near him. And I said to myself, well, my lad, if you can resist that onslaught, then you are indeed a god. <laughs> so, you know, there's an interesting history here. I was talking about how the West becomes plural, you know. So if I'm being dominated by China, I will want to know what is the chink in China's armor. How do I create two Chinas, three Chinas? And I would look to my Chinese friends and say, help me to create two Chinas, three Chinas. <laughs> you know, if India dominates me, I will look to my Indian friends and say, look, help me to create two Indias, three Indias. You know, because I want to fight you and I can't fight you if I... So Vivekananda could not fight the West without that division between men and women. <laughs> 
and the fact that men's women supported him against their men was what gave him this point of entry, right? So you need that chink in the dominant, and that's where he found it. So you can actually see that, you know, I can't do it in detail, but even just looking at the snippets of information, you can see that there's an interesting history of American feminism or American alternative movements, transcendentalism, right? Which is at work in the support that Vivekananda could get. Um, it actually comes through, I mean, just to give you one or two examples, one of Vivekananda's early hostesses and patrons in Boston, Miss Kate Sanborn, was herself a lecturer and author who wrote about the country life. As against, this is true of Gandhi too, actually. Gandhi would find similar allies. And this, this woman, Vivekananda's hostess, Kate Sanborn, wrote about the country life and composed small poems for friends that very clearly spoke of what she thought of men. Like one poem that this woman who supported Vivekananda wrote about men. And the poem goes like this. Though you are bright and though you are pretty, they will not love you if you are witty. Right? So you have to be a little dumb for the men to love you. And another of Vivekananda's hostess, Miss Kate Tanat Woods, was also a lecturer and author who wrote many books, including Hester Hepworth, which was a story of the witchcraft delusion in Massachusetts. So these were clearly people and individuals, families, mostly women, who were looking inside the West to create a plural West, and sometimes influenced by American transcendentalism. And in fact, in the Woods family, it was always said that Vivekananda and Gandhi were, the, were more Christ-like than any of that the world has known. So if it was the ladies of the West and not men who received Vivekananda's critique of the West enthusiastically, the situation was not all that different from Mohandas Karamchad Gandhi, whom we call Mahatma Gandhi, when he first came to London in the 1880s, few years, few years before Vivekananda as a student. And his inspiration came as his great-granddaughter Leela Gandhi, my colleague, has shown in her splendid book, Effective Communities, that Gandhi's inspiration to critique the West came from non-mainstream personalities such as the homosexual anti-imperial writer Edward Carpenter or the vegetarian animist, animal welfareist and anti-imperial Henry Salt. So she actually shows that it's the homosexuals, it's the vegetarians, uh, it's the anti, uh, it's the animal welfare, it's people who did not fit in in the mainstream, were the people who became Gandhi's friends and allowed Gandhi to see a plural West, again to create, to find the chink in the West's armor. At the end of the 19th century, when most major leaders and thinkers of the West were brimming with confidence about the righteousness of European empires and their civilizing missions, Indian interlocutors of the West could only speak to those parts of the West that were themselves marginalized. The spiritualists, women, homosexuals, vegetarians, and so on. Imperial success, as, as Ashish Nandi, who has already spoken to you, put, his, put, it, put in his provocative book, The Intimate Enemy. Had, Ashish Nandi argues very interestingly that, imperials, that the Europeans paid a price for imperial success. And men paid that price. He became European men became hyper masculine. You know, public school was the school that made them hyper masculine. And he has a very interesting discussion of Rudyard Kipling in that context. And and hyper masculinity meant that the European men themselves sidelined whatever from a psychological point of view could be thought of as feminine or childlike in the European personality trait. It was only after the end of the First World War that claims of civilizational superiority of the West came to be questioned by Western intellectuals themselves. So uh, at the end of the First World War, there's not only, of course, the great um, Spengler's book, The Decline of the West, which is 1919, but the First World War was a brutal war because there was trench warfare, there was up-close warfare in the trench, then sh trenches were shelled. The expression shell shocked comes from First World War. There were artistic responses uh, to the experience of the war. And there was a lot of uh, disappointment within the West itself about the civilizational superiority of the West that had been sustained in the late 19th century to 
the time to the First World War. <coughs> Um, in fact, if you look at the 1920s, 30s, you find very interesting characters. There are people like Anand, uh, there's a man called, I don't know if you know of him, Anand Kentish Kumaraswam, who was born of, one of his parents was British, one of his parents was Indian. He was the curator of Indian art in, in Boston. And Kumaraswam, he became a very, belonged to a very famous group of Nietzscheans. Nietzscheans who looked to Asia and Asian art to criticize West. I mean, in, in part of course, this was, you know, this was this faded to Japanese pan Asianism and all of those things. Uh, but they're very interesting. But these, this you can even even see uh, in uh, this is captured in what even the English wrote. And there's a particular letter that I want to read out to you a little bit, which will give you some sense of how the Europeans were feeling. So this is a letter that was written by the very well-known European political scientist, uh, English political scientist Harold Last. And Lasky was one political scientist with whom many Indian students were doing their PhDs. And he was, Nehru would write to him, he was in touch with Indian students. And this is a letter he wrote in June 1923 to a very well-known uh, man in America, Felix Frankfurter, who was a Harvard professor and later a judge at the Supreme Court of the United States. And in that letter, Lasky says, the truth is, dear Felix, that we ought not to stay in India. Literally and simply, we are not morally fit to do the job. So if you had asked a European man in the 1890s or 1910s, he would say, my moral task is to rule these people. By the end of the war, they're saying, we are not morally fit because we have committed so many immoralities ourselves. And he says, we are not morally fit to do the job, on all of which, please read E.M. Foster's A Passage to India a classic novel that actually shows the chink in the imperialist armor. And then he says, I, I have my great doubts whether the Indians can govern themselves. But it is better for them to make efforts than to have this running sword at the heart of things. If they fail, let it be their failure. Our success, if it were not too late, would only deepen their sense of inferiority. So what thus came under a dark cloud of doubt in this period was the very idea that had become triumphant by the end of the 19th century that the West was civilizationally superior to the rest of the world and that its civilizational superiority gave it the right to rule others. Now from here, I will, I will actually have to, have to uh, cut through some of the, the interests of time, even though I had a lot of time, but I have also uh, uh, to leave about half an hour for discussion. Let me just uh, from here go on to uh, the question of Tagore and Tagore on civility. Um, so, as I was saying, that Indians were using the idea of civilization and civility uh, against the West. We can now go on to uh, yeah, the next one. So, this is what you have is Tagore and Gandhi. And I would again like you to take note of what they're wearing. I'll come back to the question of what they're wearing, the politics of clothing, later. But you can, uh, you can notice that, in other words, the four men I talk about, they will all experiment, what in English you would call a sartorial experimentation. They were all experimenting with what to wear. None of them actually wear what Indians would normally wear. Um, so, Tagore, uh, uh, basically to say that in that same essay in 1941 when he died, in the, written in the year when he died, the crisis of civilization, Tagore actually made the point that all his life, he had believed that Europe was to be the fount of a new civilization in the world. But he was also saying, as, I'm, as I leave the world, this faith is coming into a crisis, that Europe is the fount of civilization. In 1934, he had written an essay, which is actually the name of the book in which the 41 essay is included, called Kalantar, Change of Times. And this is, in this essay, you can see that he was very aware of the negative side of how Europeans had used the word civilization. So he said, I'm quoting Tagore, gradually we saw that outside of nations Europeans considered their own, the torch of European civilization was not for the purpose of illumination, but for starting fires. That is why, that, that is why one day China's heart was bombarded with cannonballs and balls of opium, which is, which has some reference to the Chinese criticism of Tagore, 
with the opium, yeah. Both the opium of the masses as well as the opium, the opium you have to fight, right, in your own history. Um, Schuster's strangling of Persia shows how civilized Europe, once strangled with both hands, young Persians determined to give their lives to liberating Persia from long-term inertia. On another side, everybody knows how in the Congo region of Africa, European rule had transformed into indescribable horror. The, again, the horror, of course, reminds you of Con Conrad. The Great War has suddenly lifted a curtain on Western history. We watched Japan, the leading student in Europe's classroom, in Korea, in China, laughing off criticisms with examples from European history. So he reads, Japan is saying, why can't we do these terrible things if the Europeans can do the terrible things? The Europe that once called Turkey inhuman now hosts the indiscriminate terror of fascism in her open courtyard. Yet, for all this, Tagore refused to give up what he calls my faith in men. And why was he so, and that faith in men was connected to his appreciation of European civilization. And I want to briefly go through what his arguments were. Basically, he said, I'm quoting again, he said, the advent of the English in Indian history was a strange affair. As human beings, they remain much more distant from us than the Muslims who came. But no foreign nation can match the depth and pervasiveness of the intimacy that the English, as ambassadors of the spirit of Europe, have forged with us. So he said they are not socially close, but they are spiritually close. And how is that possible? His answer was fourfold. He says one was, what were the gifts of Europe he, he was talking about? He said one is modern science or reason. And again it goes back to very much the answer he was giving to his, his Chinese friends. And every day, he says, every day she conquers the world of knowledge because her pursuit of reason is pure, free as it is from all feelings of personal attachment. So almost, a, he, he could have said in today's terms, he could have said, one gift of Europe was Kant. And Kant, by the way, was a very, very popular philosopher, at least in Bengal throughout the 19th century. Some of the most uh, illuminating commentaries on Kant actually are written in Bengali that I have read. Uh, so there was a deep engagement with Kant in 19th century. But Kant and Hegel were two philosophers that Bengal is engaged with, I think, quite deeply. The second important European idea to impact on India, he said, was the idea of equality before the law. And he said one message contained in the new British rule was that crime was to be judged independently of the person committing the crime. Whether a Brahmin killed a Shudra, Shudra is the lowest of the fourfold caste order. Whether a Brahmin killed a Shudra, or a Shudra a Brahmin, the offense of murder belonged to the same class and the punishment was the same. And he said, we did not have this idea, which, on which as a historian I have to agree with him. The idea of equality. He actually also goes on to say, while the idea is not very powerful in our everyday life, we cannot imagine an India where this is not true. Where this is it. Third was, he said, no human being could be a property of another. No slaves. And finally, he said, there was the message of self-determination or self-government, sovereignty, that he also saw as a fundamental message of Europe. He said that today, in spite of all our weaknesses, we can attempt to change the, the situation of our nation and state is due to our taking a stand on the ground of a European theory. And he says it is on the strength of this theory that we fight clamorously with such a powerful government over demands who we would have never been able to even dream of raising with the Mughal emperor. Which is, what was this theory? He said it is the theory of sovereignty, both of the individual and of the nation. And he says, this is a theory expressed in the poet's line. And you know, it's a fascinating line. Because he says, this is a theory expressed in the poet's line. And then actually quotes a line in English. And I don't know if you know the line. The line is, and a man's a man for all that. Saying, a man... For all that, that is whatever you can say about a man, remains a man, a human being. That line comes from a song of that title written by the Scottish national poet Robert Burns in 1795. Right? So the message of the Scottish Enlightenment having con been converted into a popular song turns up in Tego's Bengali essay as a fragment of English quotation and as a presence of the Scottish Enlightenment, again creating that plurality 
of Europe and India. A man's a man for all that. Now, there is no doubt that there is a certain degree of idealization of Europe that only the colonized would create. You know, it is only the colonized who could actually idealize Europe. If you read Franz Fanon, only as a colonized he could say that all the ingredients of human emancipation are available in European thinking, but Europeans don't know how to package them right. So we have to do their job. Right? It's like Bernard Shaw saying, the English don't know how to speak English, so me, Irishman, I have to do it for them. You know, so he wrote Pygmalion uh, on, on that basis. Um, most Indians, down to Nehru, had this idea of two Europeans, two Englishmen. They used to think that there was a good Englishman and a bad Englishman. The bad Englishman came to India, and the good Englishman remained home. Um, but the good Englishman was actually an idealization that only we could produce. But having produced it, we could go to the English and say, this is your better self. Why don't you act according to your better self? And there were enough of Englishmen who would support us in saying that. And that's why eventually, Tagore's, um, what Tagore said about European civilization, he actually said in 1934, he said, we have seen, and I'll just read this and go on, we have seen Europe cruelly unscrupulous in its politics and commerce, widely spreading slavery over the face of the earth in various names and forms, and yet, in this very same Europe, protest is always alive against its own inequalities. So actually, again, I go back to the point that what made Europe civilized what not? What we're not sort of the modern, you know, the, the London Tunnel and the Metro and the railways and the and the hospitals that Europe claimed were markers of civilization. He's saying what makes Europe civilized is Europe's capacity to criticize its own actions with reference to some universalist ideas that are normative, that are true of all peoples, and that's what the, is the hallmark of for him for being civilized. So with that, I come to the last part of my talk. I think I've, I've explained uh, Tagore's and these people's position. Uh, hopefully, I've explained them to you. And my investment in civility. The idea of civilization is now nobody talks about it. Many reasons for it. Because within India, a kind of an idea of nationalism based on Indian civilization came to be questioned by, for instance, Muslims who said, you know, this civilization that you call Indian is actually Hindu. Lower castes, who said the text on you, based on the basis of which you talk about civilization, is actually upper caste. Brahmins wrote these texts. Later on, women would say these texts on the basis of which you conduct, you carry out civilization as male texts. So, for all those sorts of reasons, the word civilization fell into disuse and, 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 and disrepute. Um, and of course, in the 50s, both in China and India, the, the whole confidence in the idea of development progress came back, became resurgent in the 50s after independence, both in China and in India, that our task was to develop. Often in global discussions in the 50s, you will find in modernization theory, they use China and India as two contrary examples. You know, can, can a poor country be democratic and develop economically? Or does a poor country need to be authoritarian and mobilize resources in order to develop democratically? So development beca became a, one of the most important tropes. And actually, I've just read a manuscript that, uh, of uh, a China scholar called Andrew Jones, uh, who is publishing a book with Harvard. And I, I was asked to write an endorsement for it. So I just read him, uh, giving a fascinating account of how the idea of development comes into the writing of Lu Sun and his contemporaries. As a, as a trope in literature. But I'm, what I'm saying is that the idea of development has a second life. So the idea of development, the idea of progress was a child of the idea of civilization. And the idea of progress, his height was 1890s, I would say 1880s to 1914. The idea of development is another, is a grandchild. It's a child of the idea of progress, grandchild of the idea of civilization, and lived very, very powerfully in the 1950s, 60s. Uh, right to the uh, and then modernization comes back with your four modernization program later on after Mao's death and of course the death of Gandhi uh, also basically brought to an end civilizational discourse even in the 40s Nehru can I maybe go on to the next slide thank you that's Nehru and I always I remember I asked you to notice what he's wearing too 
not I mean I'm wearing his jacket now but that's only because he he started doing it uh, but but you know um, Nehru was arguing with Gandhi in the 1940s saying why do you think we should go back in villages what we need are cities what we need is science technology modernization that's how we're going to progress there's a very beautiful letter actually written by Gandhi where he says and maybe it makes sense to you living in Shanghai it definitely does make sense to me uh, when I see LA or when I see Calcutta my city when I go to Mumbai Gandhi wrote a letter in which he said you know and you'll see how utopian Gandhi was he said and I'm reading it at a time when actually most people are leaving villages to come to the towns in, the, in India urbanization is growing in India because people oh, everybody wants to move to the cities Gandhi's letter says I'm convinced that if India is to attain true freedom and through India the world in other words if Indian idea of freedom has to be a vision for the world an alternative vision then sooner or later people will have to live in villages not in towns crore one crore is 10 million crores of people will never be able to live in peace with each other in towns and palaces you must not imagine I'm envisaging our village life as it is today my ideal village will contain intelligent human beings there will be neither plague nor cholera nor smallpox no one will be idle no one will wallow in luxury <laughs> to which Nehru replied a village normally speaking is backward intellectually and culturally and no progress can be made from backward environment we have to encourage the village to approximate more to the culture of the town so that's how civilization died the only one living legacy of the idea of civilization that India was civilized is Indian democracy and I'll tell you very quickly why it is because you know there's a line in John Stuart's Mill book on representative government where he says there cannot be no universal adult franchise without universal adult education India on independence decided to give the vote to everybody when 70% 80% of Indians could not read or write so on what basis did they have the confidence to give the vote to everybody Gandhi was asking for vote for everybody from 1921 Tagore was saying similar things in the 1930s and you know what the faith was this was said in the Indian Constituent Assembly that wrote the Constitution Radha Krishna the philosopher stood up and said our peasant may be illiterate but our peasant is civilized because India has a civilization and civilization will prepare the peasant to carry out the job of the citizen and therefore Indian experiment in democracy which completely did away with this premise of 19th century liberalism that you have to move people gradually towards citizenship came out of a faith in the idea of civilization and was a gesture if I may say so of civility on the part of the elites to the subalterns a gesture of inclusiveness right and that's why one thing I want to say about the clothes of everybody here is that they wore clothes deliberately which they thought would be inclusive in other words which will symbolically represent the poor underprivileged um, Indian who lived in poverty and lack of luxury so that's why their clothes were very simple uh, and Gandhi as you know Gandhi actually thought for one whole month before deciding what to wear in India um, so it was very very well, they were, so they were all experiments they were all sartorial experiments but the interesting thing about their clothes I'm soon going to talk about a particular pipe, bit of cloth that's why I'm talking about clothes is that it was to be inclusive so with that uh, I thought that civilization had something to do with um, with uh, inclusivity and with democracy let me go on to fast forward to today and I want to talk about a particular incident in India that happened last year in 2009 which is about the West which is about the West as something that is inherent in cultural objects you know so that you look at a cloth top piece of cloth and say that's a Western dress right when you see West already embodied it was also a debate about Western culture what does West mean it was also a debate in the context in which we still find the West powerful 
uh, yesterday there was an interesting discussion about the sari, and I'm sure Teju knows. Mm. Newspaper discussion reports actually say, I haven't seen official statistics, newspaper discussion reports actually say that the sale of sari in India is falling. Um, and this is borne out if you actually talk to sari sellers, at least, you know, uh, in terms of their experience. Um, so, in some ways, there are now new rituals in India. There's a certain kind of craziness when I go to India at Christmas time. Uh, in Calcutta, most families I know would buy a Christmas, Hindu family, buy a Christmas tree and have cake. You find long lines in front of, sort of cake shops, bakeries. Uh, and you, you see these faces that, I mean, you could see that their fathers never did it, you know, but they all do it now. And the West, the West does not have any longer a civilizational superiority, nor is the discussion like the Gandhi Tagore type discussion of civilization around. But the West still actually embodies some sort of a greater power for access to material consumption. So the West particularly connotes a lifestyle. And around lifestyle, there's an interesting debate in India, sometimes which takes violent forms, which something which has to do with inequality in the country but also has to do with freedom, also has to do with all these normative ideas that we talk about. And I want to take you through one such episode, which, uh, and the particular incident I'll use is last year's incident. But in February, in February every new year, young Indians today celebrate Valentine's Day. Do you do it in China? Is Valentine's Day popular? <laughs> you know about Valentine's Day? Right, so Valentine's Day is when you give flowers and a card to the person you love. So it's a lover's day. And particularly for young people, it's become very important in the cities. As tell, and it's part of the, you know, the media promotes it. It's part of the new consumer culture. There's no question. And this has become a cultural craze in India. On, but last year, on 24th January 2009, a bunch of men belonging to a self-styled extremist Hindu organization called Ram Seni, warriors of the god King Rama, a mythical god King Rama, physically assaulted young women visiting a pub in the town of Mangalore in Karnataka where Teju's uh, institute is in that in the province. So these, these people run by uh, the, the state government which is actually run by a Hindu party, BJP, were initially soft on the perpetrators of this violence, especially their leader, a man called Pramod Muthalik. I'll show you his photos. Muthalik was uh, both a kind of retired army man but with a long past in Hindu style politics, you know, anti-Muslim, and but he's also become anti-West, but he's part of the middle class. Uh, and so they went and actually beat up. Now I'm sorry for this, you know, the quality is very bad. I downloaded them from online uh, Indian television channels, but, but these are basically, I'll just quickly go through them. They're basically like this young girl is crying because she had been beaten up uh, for going to a pub. So their idea was that the, just as you know, the pub is a Western culture, and they would claim that this is not part of Hindu culture, not our women. Our women should not go and drink in public, and the only way to bring them back to correct them uh, was to produce immediately a correction facility by beating them up. <laughs> so and and also on 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 Indian streets, you will find uh, these symbols of the heart that they would put up on Valentine's Day, and you'll find some people actually breaking down that symbol, uh, vandalizing it. So, so I'm going to, uh, I'll, so I'll just come to it. So what happened was, um, so when Muthalik was doing this, let me just go back to this. Okay, so, so, so on Valentine's Day, and Muthalik actually came on a television interview. And to justify his action, he says, he says, you know, why do we need this Valentine's Day, one day in the year? He said, it, it, it is all right in the West, because in the West, they love each other only for one day in the year. <laughs> They're selfish people, they don't love each other, they don't care for their parents, you know, they divorce their wives and their partners. So one day in the year, they have to say, I love you. But we in India love them every day. Right? So, so we don't need one special day on which to express our love. And therefore, on, and they actually announced that his group would forcibly abduct and marry off any young couple being found romantic in public. You know, so if you actually express your love in a park, we'll come and take you and marry you off. You'll have to marry the, you'll have to marry the man you've just kissed. Right? 
So, a group of feminists formed an alliance called the Consortium of Pub-Going, Loose and Forward Women, <laughs> who on 5th February started a campaign of collecting. So this is um, a newspaper report. I don't know. You probably can't read it. It says they were collecting pink underwears. So they started a campaign to collect pink underwears for, from women and send these underwears to Muthalik and his men. So the consortium was called Consortium of Loose, Public and Forward Women, Pub Going and Pub Going and Forward Women. And the Hindi word, Hindi, Hindi Punjabi word for women's underwear is chaddi. So this was a movement to collect chaddis and send chaddis to Muthalik. Actually, uh, they, their aim was to collect some 3,000 chaddis I think 12,000 were collected. So women sent their chaddis in big numbers. And the campaign actually became very powerful in the English language media. And the feminists actually ran uh, an animation campaign against Muthalik, which was fascinating. So I'm going to, so just one, yeah. So that is the poster. This Valentine's Day, send Sri Ram Sene, send the Sri Ram Sene a pink chaddis. Because chaddis are forever. <laughs> so the, the, the pink underwear is immortal. Send them, and it's also to suggest to them that they're really being cowardly and effeminate if they want to beat up women. If, if their only way they can show their masculinity is by becoming violent. And this was animation. So this is Muthalik. <laughs> And the last one said, have you sent your pink chaddis? <laughs> it's an interesting, um, you know, we could discuss it later on, but it's an interesting, um, um, it was an interesting debate for me to watch from, as, as an outsider who lives outside India, to think about it. And to see how different the West has become in its connotation. Now you have to remember that during Valentine's Day, the newspapers published reports of how much money people actually spend on conspicuous consumption. All the expensive hotels in the big cities get booked up. Honeymoon suits get booked up. People book dinners for that involve payments of amounts of money that are sometimes 10 times, 20 times a full professor's monthly salary. So, so there are three things coming together. One is consumerism, the, the inequality that is produced by consumerism. Second is the importance of the media, particularly television, visual media. And then thirdly, my question is, in this kind of politics of consumerism, what is the role of the West? What does the West signify? So you can see the West here is coming as part of a claim to lifestyle. The West. I mean, after all, Indian women, you know, Teju was talking about the modern way of wearing sari. This underwear is obviously not traditional. Uh, my mother didn't wear this sort of underwear. Uh, how do I know that? I assume. <laughs> my wife does. <laughs> so, so there's been a huge generational change in, the, in matters of what people wear. Uh, and now it's common in middle class women to wear such underwear. But you see, I still have cousins who don't. Uh, and, and you see some people as more westernized who wear them and some people as less westernized. But, you, but the, there are two things I want to say about this debate. One is that, so the West is no longer a question of civilization. The West, the West is a question of lifestyle. It is a question of freedom, of choice, of lifestyle, of consumption. It is also a question politically of actually freedom from violence in public space. But at the same time, I can't help noticing, you know, the humor, I mean, the, the animation was very humorous and actually Sometimes uh, friends have pointed out to me that even you could actually look at a lot of the humor as what they call SNM or queer humor. But at the same time, what I can't help noticing is, in a way, a certain kind of politics of intolerance, even as people are making their claims. Clearly, for Muthalik, 
the intolerance is obvious. And it takes the form of violence, where he actually goes and beats up women who are in these pubs. For this campaign, if you look at this picture, it's also a picture of actually gagging Mutalik, silencing. So in the way that, you know, in the animation, it, this happens very quickly. And he's actually, in the animation, he's trying to talk. As he's trying to talk, the chaddis all come and silence him. Right? And to, for me, it's a very interesting moment in this debate, where both sides, in different ways, are actually not letting the opposition speak. In the, in the feminist case, it's actually made through humor, uh, through a politics of humor, through alongside all the other claims. Uh, in the in Muthalik's case, it's very direct. And without commenting on anybody, this is the loss of the middle ground. See, in this debate, there's no middle ground. It's almost either you live or I live. The position always is that your existence is a threat to my existence. The Muhar Muthalik is very clear that pub-going women are a threat to Indian culture and to his masculinity. And Muthalik, with his violence, is a threat to the freedom of lifestyle, which is happening in a context of, as I said, consumerism, inequality, mediatization of everyday life. Um, but this is very, very different location of the West from what I was talking about before. So to come to the end of my talk, you may ask, what should, why should we care about civility? Even, let's say, in this debate. Isn't intolerance the only fitting answer to the intolerance of a Muthalik? Besides many Indian friends who have seen Dalit leaders of recent times, that is, Dalits are you know, people who were considered untouchable once, and that's illegal now. And in recent political past, in, in the electoral politics of India, sometimes Dalit leaders have made a deliberate point of being abusive towards the opposition, that is, towards the upper castes, in their electoral speeches. And have actually used to great effect what I would regard as uncivil language in public life. And in that context, people may ask me, isn't civility an elitist project? And I always think one has to make a distinction between etiquette and civility. Etiquette is something you have to learn. You know, how do you behave? Etiquette is like protocol. How do you behave in a court? If you went to a Mughal court, do you show your back to the emperor while leaving the court? Say, I don't know in the Ming court what they would have done. But in the Mughal court, you could not... You could not take leave by turning around. You had to sort of back away from the emperor because your face had to face them. That's etiquette. Civility is the question of being sensitive to somebody else without knowing etiquette. I may not know the protocol, but I still have a sense of being decent to you. Right? And in fact, so when people say, does it not hide claims to privilege? I will say, well, you only have to live in India, or even to visit India, to know that the classes that suffer the worst form of incivility are the subaltern classes, not the wealthy or the powerful elites. People who are treated roughly every day, badly every day, are the people who have no power, no wealth. And therefore, I actually accept the old argument of Edward Schultz that institutions of civil society decay if there is no civility in public life if there is no culture of respect for lives of others. And I think the Indian democracy, the very act of giving the vote to everybody, was a gesture of respect to the peasant who had no education and who, by John Stuart's Mill's theory, would not have been qualified to receive that right. But my argument, in some ways, what I presented to you is an argument internal to India. Maybe it applies to China, I don't know. The important issue I wanted to extract from my short history of the work that the word civilization performed for Indian nationalists of a bygone era is this. Indian nationalism as practiced by the likes of Vivekananda, Gandhi, Tagore or Nehru in the context of British rule was based on certain debatable but key terms supplied by Europe and shared on both sides and debated on both sides. The meaning of such words, the meaning of the word civilization was always unstable. It differed in different hands. Gandhi and Tagore even famously clashed a few times over its meanings. Yet it was the sharing of some critical terms that created a room for dialogical maneuvers even within the vice grip of power, of domination. 
And that was because in sharing with the colonized two overarching themes of modernity, two overarching themes of modernity, what are they? One is human control over the forces of nature and human freedom from oppressions by other humans. I mean, these are the two aspects of modernity in modern times. One is human control over forces of nature, which now faces ecological critiques. And the other one is freedom from oppression by other humans, whether it's a man or it's a class. In sharing with the colonized these two important ideas, Europe exhibited enough contradictions within herself to provide the colonized with terms with which to criticize Europe's doings. In the concrete, they produce the kinds of friendships, alliances, hybridities, and ambivalences that Ashish Nandi, Leela Gandhi, Homi Bhabha, and others have written about. This returns me to the question that I began with, as I welcome the prospect of China and India taking their place among the dominant nations of the world, I wonder if they would help create new visions of humanity and help humans achieve justice and fairness in a world racked by problems of planetary proportions, climate change, food securities, global refugees and asylum seekers, failed states, and terrors of various kinds. Or would we continue to think the world through ideas that became global during the era of European ascendance and that still constitute our vision of civility or even normative ideas, even as Indians and Chinese national elites pursue the American model of domination through economic, military, and technological means, and the actual prospect of achieving civility between the powerful and the powerless recedes into a horizon that seems increasingly distant. For me, it still remains an open question, for I hope that one day the aspiration to move from made in China to created in China will relate not only to things material, such as designs of cars or a computer program, but to visions of humanity as well. But for this to happen, humanist critiques of China, India, US, and the West will have to issue from some shared grounds of thinking. And I take the conversations represented by this series of lectures to be working towards creating that possibility. Thank you very much.